Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we're going to go over the Come Follow Me Lesson 4, April 27th through May 3rd, 2020. This is covering Mosiah chapters 7 through 10. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Yay, Scriptures, so good to see Uh, you. It's so great. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 27 minutes, 20 seconds. Not bad. Seems to be in the same kind of ballpark. Still kind of keeping around that half hour mark there. Yeah. A little less than five minutes a day. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, so let's jump into Mosiah chapter 7. Now, in last episode, King Benjamin had passed away and Mosiah had taken over his reign of king and he had three years of peace. And now we are coming into chapter 7. We're about getting ready to go back in time and cover a story that's been happening in the South the whole time we've been talking about things in the North. And it's first mentioned in Omni in 27 through the rest of the book here. He talks about a certain number who went up to the wilderness to return to the land of Nephi. Now, remember, they already left the land of Nephi to come to Zarahemla. They go up to Nephi, which is in the south. If you're confused about the ups and downs in north and south, uh, we've got a video on uh, the directions and the layout of the map based on the scriptures. You could just do an overview. But essentially, up is elevation. They went up into the highlands in the south uh, with a large number. And then there was something that happened. It said their leader being a strong and mighty man, a stiff-necked man, wherefore he caused a contention. What, What contention did he cause? Uh, among them, they, all, all of them died. They fought amongst themselves. All of them died, but 50. And then it came to pass that an, uh, they went down again. They, who's they? Who's leading this group? They took a significant number, including Amalekai's brother. So this is what we learned from Omni. Right. So at this point, he doesn't know what happened to them. Nobody does. And then we kind of go on through uh, King Benjamin and, and into the kingship of Mosiah. So what I thought I would do is let's just do a quick overview of the events so you can see graphically what's happening in the north, what's happening in the south. And then when we read, because there's a lot of flashbacks going on here, when you read it, then you'll know which place you're in in the story. So very briefly, if you'll recall, Mulekites were in the north, the people of Zarahemla, and the Nephites and Lamanites were in the south. They had become, the Nephites, so wicked that God took those who would listen to him with this guy named Mosiah. Uh, He led them by uh, prophecy and revelation. They traveled in the wilderness. They got to the people of Zarahemla. They met them. They joined them and became one people. Now the Nephites are here. The Lamanites are down here. And then there's a guy named Zenith who travels down, and this is where the story of Omni gets going. The first group, they're led by somebody else, not Zenith, but he's part of the group. They go down. It doesn't work out. We'll read about that. They go back, and that's when Zenith says, you know what? I want to do this peaceably. He gets a whole bunch of people together who agree with him. They go down, and that's when everybody loses contact with them in the north. Then we have King Benjamin and Mosiah. But meanwhile, in the south, we've got Zenith and then his son, Noah. That's where an Abinadi comes in and Alma and the baptisms at the water of Mormon, the bondage to the Lamanites, Limhi, King Noah's son becomes king. And then eventually a group comes down to find out whatever happened to those guys, led by a man named Ammon. He finds them, he helps rescue them, brings them back, and then everybody is together there. One thing that happens before they get rescued, Limhi sends a group out to try to find Zarahemla and ask for help. They go all the way to the north, find the land that we call Desolation, and come back supposing that Zarahemla had been destroyed and no help is coming. Days after, Ammon arrives and then the rescue happens. Okay, so that's the overview. I don't want to, I feel bad about all of the spoilers, but I think it's helpful to just see it. And then you'll know where we are in the story when we get there, starting in chapter 7. You kind of spoiled the next few episodes. I'm sorry. All right. Well, let's go back. Chapter 7, right? Yes. So what are our initial thoughts of Chapter 7? Well, in Chapter 7, you know what I'd like to do as we look at 7? We'll talk about the events, but I want to connect the idea 
of the rescue that's happening because now Ammon is going to take a group. They're going to go down to find out whatever happened to these guys, Zenith's group that left a couple generations before. But while we look at that story, which is a cool story, let's look for lessons we can learn about how we could rescue others, how we could minister to others. So it begins here in verse one with desire. The king is desirous to know. This is King Mosiah the second. He's desirous to know concerning the people. Whatever happened to those people? So that desire, first of all, is what can spark good ministering. Now, there's other people that desire it too. As a matter of fact, there's other people that desire it so much that they are they keep pestering the king. What's unclear is why the hesitation. And we don't know. Why didn't the king just say, okay, guys, go down if you want to go down? I'm curious too. It's possible that it may have something to do with riling up the Lamanites. Keep in mind that his dad, King Benjamin, had spent much of his life dealing with wars with the Lamanites. Going into Lamanite lands could stir up some problems. I don't know, but something seemed to keep him from acting until it says that they wearied him with their teasings. So I went to the Webster's Dictionary for 1828, and it says that teasing is vexing with importunity. Aha. Uh-huh. Jay? Yes? What's importunity? I'm glad you asked. I looked up that too. Importunity is an urgent request or application for a claim or favor, which is urged with troublesome frequency or pertinacity. Oh. What's pertinacity? To be pertinacious means holding or adhering to any opinion, purpose, or design with obstinacy. Now I get it. Wait, what's or? That's a conjunction, and they wrote a song about it. They did. So if you want to, you could just check that out at Schoolhouse Rock. Yes. Now, the idea here is that they are urging him with frequency. They're constantly bringing it up. And what a wonderful thing to think about where ministering is concerned. This is constantly, our families, our friends are constantly on our mind. That We have a desire for them. So then what do they do? Verse 2, verse 3, strong men are chosen. The Lord needs strong and mighty people to do his work. And here we have them chosen. Ammon is leading a group of 15 others who are headed to find out. Interestingly enough, Ammon is a descendant of Zarahemla. Right. He's not a Nephite. No. And he seems to want to know what happened to those of his people that went. So it's not just knowing about the Nephites, but apparently some other people of Zarahemla went. Either way, he cares about them. He wants to know what happened. And it doesn't matter if they're in our family or in our clique or in our friend group. To be a good minister is to reach out no matter what the situation there. In verse 4, they didn't know what to do. They knew not the course. How many times do we look at somebody who's maybe in our family, someone we know, someone that we're invited to serve, and we just, we don't know. What course should we take to help this person? What's cool is even though they didn't know the course, they didn't say, well, we don't know the course. We're not going to do anything. They went anyway. That's the kind of strong and mighty people that are doing this. Wherefore, they wandered many days, it says in verse 4. Yeah, they didn't stop. They didn't know what to do. They weren't quite sure what the course was, but they were going to, like Nephi, just keep acting until they found it. It took them 40 days to find the people. They got to the land of Shilom, to a hill north of Shilom. As long as we've got the hill here, let me just give you a quick visual of the close-up here in the land of Nephi. We've got Shilom here, we've got Nephi here, and then we've got Shemlon that's over here, and that's where the Lamanites are. And that hill is right north of Shilom, and so they stop there. This is actually an important hill. It's brought up a couple of times, even in our lesson today. It's the hill where Mosiah, when they were leaving the land the first time, they sought refuge on that hill. And uh, King Noah is going to build a monument uh, on the hill. But we'll, for now, they're on the hill. They come down to Nephi. And then something else happens, which is unexpected. First of all, verse 6, he takes people with him. That's great, too. Don't try to do this alone. Take some people with you when you're doing your ministering. Well, and here's an interesting thought. Who are the three people that he takes with him, right? Yeah. He takes Helam, Hem, and Amalekai. 
Now, where have we heard that name before? I don't think it's the same guy. Well, and I don't think it is either, because we have an Amalekai certainly writing at the end of Omni. He's the one that gives us most information about it. King Benjamin, he and, of course, Mormon. But I don't think it's the same guy, the same uh, the son of Abinadom, largely because King Benjamin appears to have been still alive when Amalekai finished his record. And in Omni 1 verse 30, he tells us, and I am about to lie down in my grave. He wouldn't qualify as a strong and mighty man to right. accompany the journey. Unless, you know, maybe he was sick and got better. Who knows? But it's probably <laughs> not. Uh, probably not him. Uh, I can do uh, it. I feel it, great. It, it could be a son. It could be like a Malachi Jr. I don't know. But then my question would be, why wouldn't he have received the plates? Why did he give the plates? Why did a Malachi Sr. give plates to King Benjamin? Don't know. Sure. Probably Although, just a popular name. You know, just like anywhere in America, <laughs> any city in America, I can guarantee you you're going to find a man by the name of John or James, for that matter. It's just you know what, name. though, John, that is, you do bring up an interesting point. There's only two Amalekites mentioned in the Book of Mormon, and this is the second one. It would oh, be interesting go. if, and those can often be family names, so... It's interesting to wonder if this Amalekai was somehow connected with the Amalekai from the Book of Omni. Maybe he wants to know whatever happened to his uncle or, you know, the because the, the brother of Amalekai went down with Zenith. So maybe but, that's but interesting. But to be absolutely clear to our listeners, we're making stuff up here. Yeah, well, it's an so interesting now, thing to think about. It is. It is very interesting. Okay, so they meet the king. So this is what they were looking for. But it was not the response they were looking for. They get treated terribly. They get put in prison for two days before they are brought before the king. And when they're brought before the king, he's not pleasant with them. He says, I am Limhi, in verse 9, the son of Noah, who was the son of Zenith, who came out of the land of Zarahemla to inherit the land, which was the land of their fathers, who was made king by the voice of the people. Now I desire to know the cause whereby ye were so bold as to come near the walls of the city when I myself was with my guards without the gate. What Ammon and his brethren have, they have no idea what's going on. And this is another good point about ministering. Sometimes we're treated rudely or badly or unjustly by those we strive to help because there's a whole other story going on that we don't know about. In this case, if you know the story, there's priests of Noah that are out there. They're stealing things. They're in bondage to the Lamanites. They're in a terrible situation. They're not feeling neighborly. They're not inviting people over for a cupcake. This is a really strenuous situation that they're in. And we'll find out later that the king suspected that they were somebody else. Yeah. Somebody, an an enemy. Yep. You know, so, you know, just like in our ministering families, they don't know necessarily that you're here to help them or to sell them a timeshare. Yeah, we don't know what's going on in their life, you know, so that's a great point. Uh, But I love that the king is challenging them because they were so bold. And yet sometimes boldness is exactly what we need because it got them in a situation where the king could get to know them. So uh, verse 11, we should just read that. And now for this cause have I suffered that ye should be preserved that I might inquire of you or else I should have caused that my guard should have put you to death. Ye are permitted to speak. Yikes. So what do you say against that kind of unjustified, at least from their perspective, anger, hostility? He gets up and he says in verse 12, O king. I am very thankful before God this day that I am yet alive and am permitted to speak, and I will endeavor to speak with boldness. For I am assured that if ye had known me, ye would not have suffered that I should have worn these bands and so forth. So he talks about who he is and what his situation is. And by the time when they actually get to talk to each other, that's when not only does the hostility melt away, But in verse 14, it says that he was exceedingly glad Limhi was. So now this whole thing has changed. Sometimes people, we need to give them an opportunity to get to know us. As you look at this, I hope you'll ask if there's any part of this that could help you as you seek to minister to family, friends, uh, in the church. If ye had known me, ye would not have suffered. 
me, that I'd be essentially treated badly. So verse 14, he was exceedingly glad. And then this isn't enough. Limhi is going to get his people excited. At the end of verse 14, I will cause that my people shall rejoice also. The reason he's so excited is that these people are going to help deliver them. Now, what can they do? They're 16 strong and mighty men. They can't fight off the Lamanites, but they're offering hope they didn't have before. They're giving a testimony that Zarahemla still exists. There's a place they could escape to. And they know how to get there. They know how to get there. That's, that's right. Well, that'll be coming up. That's a very good point, John. So there is hope now of deliverance. And maybe sometimes that's all we can offer. It's interesting that they don't really, Ammon and his brethren don't really fix anything but they provide the way that Limhi and his people can fix their own problem, being guided by the Lord when they escape. And we'll get to that. That's later in Mosiah. Now, there's one other thing to mention in, in 16. It says that they had suffered many things at the end of 16. And we're talking about Ammon and his brethren. We don't get that earlier on, but not only do we see the tenacity of Ammon and his brethren to reach out for the rescue, They keep going, even though they don't have the course, but they also suffered many things, hunger, thirst, fatigue. Sometimes we too, in our desire to rescue, need to suffer many things or will suffer many things, but it's okay. We just keep going. So that's what I take with me. Now, there's more of this. I'm actually going to touch on it again when we get to 21. What we've got in chapter seven is an opening And then we're going to jump back in time very shortly and tell what happened uh, in the land southward. And then we're going to have a bookend in chapter 21. So if you read 7 and 21 together, those two chapters are very complementary because they're taking place at the same time. So we're opening the book here in chapter 21 is going to be the other end of that. We'll return to this moment in chapter 21. Well, the rest of the chapter, I've got it marked out here, 17 through the rest of the chapter, is King Limhi addressing his people. And he recounts their history in summary. He says a couple of things that tie into Zenith's record. In verse 21, he says, You are all witnesses this day that Zenith, who was made king over this people, he being overzealous to inherit the land of his fathers. Now, that's not Limhi's word. That's actually he's quoting from Zenith's record therefore being deceived by the cunning craftiness. And he goes on to talk about how they got set up here. And um, then he recounts some of the tragedy that happens. Verse 26, a prophet of the Lord have they slain. Do we know who that is? If you've read the book, you do. It's Abinadi he's talking about here, who told them of their wickedness and they destroyed him or so they thought. Verse 33, he wraps it up, and you really get a great sense of who Limhi is. And we will see over the next couple of weeks what he goes through that brings him to this point, because he had a horrible father. Verse 33, but if you will turn to the Lord with full purpose of heart and put your trust in him and serve him with all diligence of mind, if ye do this, he will, according to his own will and pleasure, deliver you out of bondage. That, to me, is not only a recipe for what we need to do to overcome our challenges, but a pattern that we need to do in order to help others do the same. So that brings us to chapter 8, when Limhi is going to turn the time over to Ammon. And he says that he makes an end of speaking to his people. Our narrator, Mormon, tells us that only a few of the things that Limhi said has he written in this book, which means Limhi must have had an amazing speech, but at least we get that much of it. Mm. And then in verse 2, And he caused that Ammon should stand up before the multitude and rehearse unto them all that had happened unto their brethren from the time that Zenith went up out of the land, even until the time that he himself came up out of the land. And he also rehearsed unto them the last words which King Benjamin had taught them and explained them to the people of King Limhi so that they might understand all the words which he spake. So he's given Ammon an opportunity to fill the people in because they've been gone for a few generations. They may have known King Benjamin, but only just. And King Benjamin's speech, they certainly missed that. So what's gone on in the land of Zarahemla since they've gone? 
Yeah, it's unclear as to when Zenith left. It's likely during the early days of King Benjamin's thing by what Amalekai tells us, but uh, we don't really have any dates on that. Well, even if they left during Mosiah the First's reign, I'm sure they knew Prince Benjamin at the time. Definitely. Uh, sure. Definitely. Yeah. So there's some other great ministering things here. Notice that when given an opportunity to speak to the people, he didn't say, well, you know, let me tell you about the story of my life. You know, he wanted Ammon to stand up and tell about those things, but he also, verse 3, rehearsed unto them the last words of King Benjamin. He made sure to include the words of the prophets, because just news from Zarahemla isn't going to have the power to change lives. So when we get together with one another, and when we're trying to help minister, we should have those words in us in some capacity. And often when I commit a small quote or I've recently read something, the Lord seems to find an opportunity for me to share that thing with somebody. And so I love that they had the words of King Benjamin ready to go in whatever way they did. And then they didn't just say them, they explained them so that they would understand the words. That's good ministering right there. Especially if you consider different audiences, you know, like when you go to share, say, a message from General Conference to someone you're ministering to, are you talking to an adult? Are you talking to a five-year-old? Are you talking to a teenager? You know, make sure that you explain to your audience. Yeah. Words of Mormon tells us that King Benjamin spent his whole life working with the prophets. And, you know, the culmination of what he shares with them in his last speech is a lot of work. These people, in contrast, these are the wicked leftovers. These are the ones who didn't listen to Abinadi. They didn't listen to Alma. And now through many hard circumstances that we'll learn about, they have become humble and receptive to this message. But it doesn't mean they have the framework to understand it. So I love that he took the time to explain it to them to make sure they didn't just hear it, but they understood it. And then in verse 5, In verse 5, we have, And it came to pass that he caused that the plates which contained the record of his people from the time that they left the land of Zarahemla should be brought before Ammon, that he might read them. Uh, They're swapping stories here. I think that's really cool. One tidbit that we don't get in this account that you'd have to jump to the other bookend for in chapter 21 is when reading those records, Ammon mourns with them over their hardship. He hears about the tragedies that have happened, the lives that have been lost, including that there's a church of God and religious people off somewhere they don't know. And he mourns over all of those things with them. And that's another great thing to think about as a minister, to not only know their story, but to be able to empathize and and to mourn with those that mourn. Well, that's true. And there's one other little snippet that I want to make sure that we call out in this verse. I find it interesting that Limhi and his people are writing their records. So this is Zenith's descendants are writing a record on plates. Yeah. Plates are a thing. There were evidently several civilizations that knew that if they wanted to preserve any kind of decent record, they needed plates or a stone or something like that to be more permanent. Well, and how wonderful that they kept a record as sad as it was at times. Indeed. So we have an interesting discovery that's happening here in verse 7. Well, do you want to read the intro to that? Yeah, can we read it a little bit? Yeah. And the king said unto him, Being grieved for the afflictions of my people, I caused that forty and three of my people should take a journey into the wilderness, that thereby they might find the land of Zarahemla, that we might appeal unto our brethren to deliver us out of bondage. And they were lost in the wilderness for the space of many days. Yet they were diligent and found not the land of Zarahemla, but returned to this land, having traveled in a land among many waters, having discovered a land which was discovered with bones of men and of beasts, and was also covered with ruins of buildings of every kind, having discovered a land which had been peopled with a people who were as numerous as the hosts of Israel." And for a testimony that the things that they had said are true, they have brought 24 plates which are filled with engravings, and they are of pure gold. And behold, also, they have brought 
breastplates, which are large, and they are of brass and of copper, and are perfectly sound. And again, they have brought swords, the hilts thereof have perished, and the blades thereof were cankered with rust, and there is no one in the land that is able to interpret the language of the engravings that are on the plates. Therefore I said unto thee, Canst thou translate? He really wants to know what's on these plates. Yeah. Well, and what an amazing experience that must have been. I, I would pose the question, how did they find those plates? Imagine that whatever city or town you're living in, that the entire thing is abandoned. Nobody is in the town. And then take your journal and hide it someplace. And then tell somebody to go find it. How long would that take? So there must have been a story about how they discovered these plates. Now, all we have is certain pieces of information. But if you want to have some fun with your family or friends, well, to me it's fun. Imagine what's the story. How did it happen? Uh, Read what you can about what we know. So imagine this land. I've got a painting here of it. And imagine this desolate place, a land covered with buildings and also the bones of men and animals. And somewhere in this is a sacred writing. Now, they're not even looking for it. They don't know that they're looking for it, but they are exploring. So what's the story? Because somehow it really happened. Now, the fun part as an illustrator is that I get to ask those kinds of questions. If I were in a town or a city, let's say it's a big city, where would I go exploring first? Now, I was talking to one of my brothers and running through this scenario with him, and he, knowing a good deal about the Book of Mormon, said, well, you know, Ether, who wrote these 24 plates we're talking about at the end of the Jaredites, he was often in a cave writing this. So maybe he just hid them in a cave. It was raining. The 43 men went into the cave, and there it was. And that is absolutely possible. It's also very boring. So here (laughs) are some verses. I've pulled together some verses that I do when I use this as a fireside. You may want to have fun just looking at these references in Ether and in Mosiah. Read them and come up with your own story. But Jay, you might be saying, why don't you go ahead and tell me your story? I'm sure you have one. No, guys, I don't want to wreck it for you. Okay, yes, I will. (laughs) So here's how I picture it. And you can have your own. As a matter of fact, when I've done this with uh, especially young men, I've heard some really great stories from them about how this could have happened. So there's more than just mine, but here's mine. So somehow it says at the end of Ether that Ether hid the plates in the way that Limhi's men discovered them. So they were hidden. However it goes, we have to come up with a way to hide them, but hide them in such a way that they could be found. I would propose a stone box. We have precedent for that in the Book of Mormon, and there certainly were stone boxes in ancient America. So what if he hid it in a stone box? Now, where would I go exploring if I was, you know, in Salt Lake City and there was nobody there? Well, one place would be a religious center, but another place would be the Capitol building, some great building. If I were either, I think I might want to hide it there so that it would be, you know, it's, it should be one of the best constructed areas there. So I'm imagining them exploring and going to big buildings to see, you know, what's in them. Is there anything that we could bring back over the course of time? And we don't know how much time, but let's give it a hundred years. The buildings begin to crumble and the roof caves in on this one building and the stones break open the stone box and the sun is in exactly the right spot at the moment that they're approaching the building to check it out, that a ray of light comes down into the building through that hole at exactly the right angle and illuminates the box and shows the gold plates gleaming from within the broken cover. So that's how I imagine it. That's how I think they found the plates. They were hidden. They found them. They said, hey, this is really cool, and we're going to take it back along with all this other stuff to as proof of what's happened. And by the time they get back, it's only days later after giving the report. We'll find that out in 21. 
only days later that Ammon and his guys come and say, oh, no, Zarahemla is not, in fact, destroyed. 26 is the verse where uh, in Mosiah where they mentions that they, they supposed that Zarahemla, that that's what they'd found. They found Zarahemla and it had been destroyed. Hmm. I don't know. I picture that when you enter the land from the, of desolation from the south, there's just a large neon sign in 18 languages saying, here's our history. Here's our history. <laughs> it, there's an arrow pointing. Yes, exactly. You had to chase your lights. And, you I know. bet they would have been glad for that. I think that would provide a huge anachronistic anomaly. They could have a rest stop there with local maps. So you there could... we go. <laughs> take one. Yeah, take one. All right. <laughs> Getting back to chapter eight. Let's talk about Sears. Well, yeah, let's. And so verse 12, and I say unto thee again, this is Limhi speaking to Ammon, knowest thou of anyone that can translate? For I am desirous that these records should be translated into our language. For perhaps they will give us a knowledge of a remnant of the people who have been destroyed from whence these records came. Or perhaps they will give us a knowledge of this very people who have been destroyed. And I am desirous to know the cause of their destruction. And now Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records. For he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date. And it is a gift from God. And the things are called interpreters, and no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look for that he ought not, and he should perish. And whosoever is commanded to look in them, the same is called seer. And behold, the king of the people who are in the land of Zarahemla is the man that is commanded to do these things, and who has this high gift from God. And the king said that a seer is greater than a prophet. And Ammon said that a seer is a revelator and a prophet also, and a gift which is greater can no man have except he should possess the power of God, which no man can, yet a man may have great power given him from God. But a seer can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come, and by them shall all things be revealed, or rather shall secret things be made manifest." and hidden things shall come to light, and things which are not known shall be made known by them, and also things shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. Thus God has provided a means that man through faith might work mighty miracles, therefore he becometh a great benefit to his fellow beings. Seer is very important. Well, and it's interesting that it mentions the interpreters. The interpreters that Mosiah the second has, he would have had handed to him from his father, King Benjamin. But the first person to use them was his grandfather, Mosiah the first. And it doesn't say where Mosiah got them, but that idea of translating by the gift and power of God, we talked about that a couple, few episodes back. Right. When we're talking about it with Omni, yeah. The stone right. In the stone of Coriantumr. And so it's likely that those stones which originated with the brother of Jared. And we may trace that whole thing out when we get to the brother of Jared. But in brief, they would have been with the stone or or somehow associated with Coriantumr and not with the record of Ether, which was gotten by somebody else. So uh, it's interesting that all of those things will eventually come together again. Well, now in this day and age, certainly through the Restoration, the titles of prophet, seer, and revelator are very familiar to us. We just saw a general conference not too long ago, and that was brought up. We know that our current prophet is President Nelson, our current seer. There's a quote that I grabbed out of the old Gospel Doctrine Manual from General Conference 1994 of then Elder Board K. Packer talking about the importance of a seer and the role that they play certainly in our day and age. Quote, the scriptures speak of prophets as watchmen upon the tower who see the enemy while he is yet afar off, and who have beheld also things which were not visible to the natural eye. For a seer hath the Lord raised up unto his people. Many years ago the brethren warned us of the disintegration of the family and told us to prepare. The weekly family home evening was introduced by the First Presidency. Parents are provided with excellent materials for teaching their children with a promise that the faithful will be blessed. 
While the doctrines and revealed organization remain unchanged, all agencies of the church have been reshaped in the re their relationship to one another and to the home. The entire curriculum of the church was overhauled based on scriptures, and years were spent preparing new editions of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. We can only imagine where we would be if we were just now reacting to the terrible redefinition of the family. But that is not the case. We are not casting frantically about trying to decide what to do. We know what to do and what to teach. The course we follow is not of our own making. The plan of salvation, the great plan of happiness, was revealed to us, and the prophets and apostles continue to receive revelation as the church and its members stand in need of more, end quote. Now, this is from General Conference, April 1994. I'd like to point out that the terrible redefinition of the family has probably taken a toll quite out of the context of Elder Packer at that time, but it certainly continued in that pattern here 25 years later. You know, I was thinking if we, gosh, you know, don't we have something that's more recent in this? But I, the thing that I love about quotes from that far back that talk about the seer seeing things is how much truer those things become as time passes. However true it was in the 90s, it is infinitely more true today. And as the Lord continues to prepare uh, for gospel teaching in the home, not just family home evening now, but we've got more that's been put in place, the Come Follow Me program and so forth, that provide all the resources that we can use in our home study with our families. It's incredible for every age group. We've, it's just, I don't know, it's wonderful. Never has it been a better time to study your scriptures at your home. Absolutely. And it's funny that you should bring up something recently. This talk from Elder Packer reminded me of an October talk from just this last year from Elder Bednar, October 2019, his Watchful Under Prayer Continually, where he talks about you know, his trip to Africa and observing cheetahs approaching a group of topis. Oh, yeah. Part of that talk talks about, quote, positioned between the large group of topis and the approaching cheetahs were several older and stronger topis standing as sentinels on termite mounds. The enhanced view of the grasslands from the small hills enabled these guardian topies to watch for signs of danger. Then suddenly, as the cheetahs appeared to be within striking distance, the entire group of topies turned and ran away. I do not know if or how the sentinel topies communicated with the larger group, but somehow a warning was given and all the topies moved to a place of safety. And then later in the talk, he talks about constant vigilance is required to counteract complacency and casualness. To be vigilant is the state or action of keeping careful watch for possible danger or difficulties. And keeping watch denotes the act of staying awake to guard and protect. Spiritually speaking, we need to stay awake and be alert to the promptings of the Holy Ghost and the signals that come from the Lord's watchmen on the towers, end quote. His seers. Yeah, that's fantastic. So then we head into chapter 9. Now, what's interesting here is that we actually have a few lines right before the chapter and chapter summary. That is interesting. Now, those lines actually come from the plates. The heck you say? I do. Now, what's interesting is right before the chapter... You also get one line that says, comprising chapters 9 through 22. Now, that is not from the plates. That was added. And it was added in the 1879 edition of the Book of Mormon that was pioneered by Orson Pratt. Well, okay. This is good because it does. It separates this story out. Now this officially establishes the flashback. Yeah, it does. We're going to jump back in time. And chapters 9 and 10 are written in the first person. This is right out of Zenith's record that Mormon quotes. So first person account, chapters 9 and 10, let's take a look at it. Zenith begins the story by filling in what we've been missing in Amalekai's account at the end of Omni. 
that we read at the beginning of the episode. He says, I zenith having been taught all the language of the Nephites, again, a reference to language. Uh, there's something about record keepers and being taught in a particular language of the Nephites. And having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, now how did he have a knowledge of the land of Nephi? It seems that he had been in the land of Nephi, that he may have been at whatever age with Mosiah's people when they came out. Now, maybe it just means that he'd heard about it from somebody, but it seems, I think not, because one of the things he was chosen to do upon the return mission was to be a spy. And you would want a spy who has some idea of the lay of the land. So when we look at verses one and two, it tells us about Zenith, but would you look closely for what characteristics we can learn about him as a person? Sometimes when we just look at it, it's a, we get the idea, okay, well, this is, uh, this is the intro to a story. But getting to know Zenith is part of what's going to help us connect with his message. So let's look at a couple of things that we might see, and, and I'm sure you'll find others. So he describes Nephi as the land of their father's first inheritance and having been sent as a spy among the Lamanites. What does that say about him? If you were going to lead an invading force, who would you choose as your spy? What characteristics would you look for in a spy? I would think you would want someone who had good energy, someone who was not a klutz, but also somebody who's very smart who's wise, who can make decisions in the field, as it were, who can bring back good intelligence that could not only just be, well, you know, there's a garden of daisies over here and there's, you would want someone who knows what they're looking for and can report that back so you've got actionable information. So maybe that already tells us something about who he is. He was supposed to spy out the Lamanite forces that our army might come and destroy them. He had come with a party with the intention to destroy the Lamanites. But when I saw that which was good among them, I was desirous that they should not be destroyed. Therefore, I contended with my brethren. Now, in the previous account, it said that there was uh, the, the leader was a bloodthirsty man and, and caused contention. Well, it seems that here what had happened is that Zenith caused the contention by his own admission, by going against the plan. Against the bloodthirsty man. Against the bloodthirsty man. So what he was offering was something that was good. It was a better alternative. And apparently he was so convincing that brother fought against brother and father against a son. It says uh, father fought against father and brother against brother. I mean, this was breaking up families, this and people were willing to die to make the choice between going to war or doing it peacefully. So it must have been really remarkable. We're still only getting a small piece of it here. But regardless, this army that came down destroyed themselves down to 50 people. Now, it doesn't tell us that here. We'd have to go back to Amalekai's account at the end of Omni, where it says only 50 people were left of the invasion party. Well, and as you brought up earlier, it's a window into Zenith's character. He yeah. was not a bloodthirsty man. He yeah. was sent as a spy. He saw a people that he was supposed to get ready to invade and seek out their weaknesses and so on and so forth. And I'm he realized, to hate them. well, these people, these people aren't so bad. Maybe we can yeah. just ask yeah. to be, to be a- lead, live among them. And it turns out... That as we go further into the chapter, that's what he ends up doing in his second journey. And he succeeds, kind of. Yeah, well, that is the story. That's what begins the event. But as we follow the story, look for things that show elements of Zenith's character. He will show love, not just for his people, but he continues to show love even after being betrayed by his enemies for the Lamanites. He seems to always like the Lamanites. Anyway, this is where in verse 3 he admits that he was overzealous to go. And as a result, they didn't stay close to the Lord. They had lots of famines and afflictions in verse 3. Sore afflictions, for they were slow to remember the Lord their God. That's a lesson that they learned, as we'll see going on. 
So in verse 6, they make the second journey. They reach the king of the Lamanites and say, hey, we would like some of our land back. And surprisingly, the king of the Lamanites says, uh, sure, you can have the land of Nephi, the land of Shilom. Have at it. So they came here for the purpose of getting the capital city, the city or land of Lehi-Nephi, which sometimes gets called Nephi and sometimes get called Lehi-Nephi. So these are cities and lands roundabout. So you've got the city of Lehi-Nephi, otherwise known as Nephi. They go back and forth on that. The city of Shilom and the lands that are round about those areas. So again, the layout, we've got Shemlon here. That's where the Lamanites hang out. We've got Shilom and then we've got Lehi-Nephi here. That's the capital. Nephi must have been an amazing city because when the Nephites got kicked out, the Lamanites moved right in. That was the throne of the king was now because it must have been really beautiful. It had apparently gotten a bit run down. So that's pretty great, John. They came there. They just said, hey, can we have it? They said, you know what? We're going to move out. We're going to move back to Shemlon. Well, we'll just everybody take your stuff. Let's go. So that's pretty great. It was a sweet deal. And no blood was spilled. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, wait. No. Verse 10. Oh. So they're fixing up everything and and they're really prosperous because they're an industrious people. But verse 10, it was the cunning and craftiness of King Laman to bring my people into bondage that he yielded up the land that we might possess it. So Uh, it was a scam. It was a scam. So the idea was, I tell you what, you go ahead and take this really prosperous land. You actually do something with it. Then we'll take you over and get your stuff. And then as you're in bondage, you're basically just kind of keep producing stuff for us. And that's great because we happen to be, as verse 12 says, a lazy and an idolatrous people. Well, and they did certainly take their time. We're they told did. that 12 years passed away. It was classic, so they wasn't it? obviously built up quite a bit over 12 years, I imagine, as an industrious people. And they cleaned it up and it looked great. Yeah, and pro- the flocks and herds. And then, but you've got the, what are described here is the lazy and idolatrous Lamanites are like, I don't know. Let's, you know, I'll conquer them tomorrow. Let's, you know, it's hot today. But 12 years? I mean, that puts a new spin on procrastination as far as I'm concerned. Well, but it's interesting, just the whole strategy here. This is something that is repeated not only through the scriptures, but it is even found in our church history. Think about, for example, the Israelites in Egypt. When they were first brought there, the story of Joseph, this is the end of Genesis, and we learn in the first part of Exodus that we have our first pharaoh that doesn't know Joseph and now sees these people as a problem. And perhaps even we were jealous of their industry. Well, they certainly would like to glut themselves on their labors. Exactly. Well, and if you look at church history, you take the swamp of Commerce, Illinois. The saints come in, they build it up. It becomes Nauvoo, uh, one of the most prosperous cities at the time. It even outdid uh, Chicago for a time as a successful center of commerce. Well, we got to take this over. We got to drive these people out because we need to take their stuff. Yeah. It's just a common story. Well, they decided to attack. They came from the south of the land of Shilom. And the people were being industrious, feeding their flocks. And you could look at the battle here. As the troops come up, they flee to the city of Nephi in verse 15 and call upon Zena for protection because that's where the king is. So he is not prepared for this. It says it came to pass that they armed themselves with bows and arrows and swords and scimitars and clubs and clubs and slings. And I don't think clubs are ever mentioned in an Ephite army ever except this moment. It says we put together everything we could invent at the end of 16. And I and my people did go forth against the Lamanites to battle. But it wasn't just he and his people going against the Lamanites to battle. Excellent point. Verse 17 We have in the strength of the Lord. These people had obviously learned from their previous mistakes and they were ready to be humble 
and to depend upon the Lord for protection. And as Jay pointed out, this was obviously very unexpected for them. And to be fair, they thought that the king of the Lamanites was cool and said, yeah. hey, you can just have this <laughs> land. Right. Oh, that's great. And we've had it for 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. They, so at they this point, they don't know the coming. treachery. Yeah. No. Yeah. So in verse 18, it says, God did hear our cries and did answer our prayers, and we did go forth in his might. Yea, and we did go forth against the Lamanites, and in one day and a night, we did slay 3,043, and we did slay them even until we had driven them out of the land. The tragedy is, with great sorrow and lamentation, that 279 were slain. Now, often when we see those numbers, we think, ah, oh, it's a great victory, you know, you've, we only lost this many. But to Zenith, every soul, I get the impression, every soul mattered to him. And he buried them, he helped bury the dead with his own hands. That's the kind of leader Zenith is. He's a mm. great, great guy. And so now we go into chapter 10. We, again, we're settled. King of the Lamanites Yeah, much prosperity. Cool. We're in, you know, land of Nephi, land of Shilom, all as well. This time, though, we did have some preparations for war. Yes, okay, they learned from the last episode, but now 22 years have passed away. So it's 10 years since the last conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And Zenith, he's telling everybody, yeah, you need to go back and be industrious and, you know, fix what may have been damaged in the last battle and get ready for the next one and so on and so forth. So King Laman dies and his son, we'll call him Laman Jr., <laughs> wants to pick up where his dad left off and try to invade these people again. Well, right, because his dad, he did it like from the south. That was probably like the most direct line of attack. What kind of course they're going to expect that? So Only suckers would attack there. Th that's right. He's got some other plans. He does. But Zenith not being the fool a second time, has spies round about the land of Shemlon. That's where the Lamanites are. And he sees that they're developing their preparations for war. So he's prepared. Now, they're heavily outnumbered. But let's see what he does to compensate for that. And again, it'll tell us more about the kind of leader he is. So, this time in verse 8, it says that they're going to attack on the north. Now, if our layout is right, that's not the most direct route. That would be the route that maybe they wouldn't expect. They certainly wouldn't because they attacked from the south last time. He arms his people. He's obviously much more prepared after 10 years of preparation. But that he also, in verse 9, caused that the women and children should be hid. He's carefully, in case something goes horribly wrong, he is making sure that they are as protected as they can be. Hides them in the wilderness. And then he caused that not only all his old men that could bear arms do, but also all the young men. Everybody that can fight is armed to do so. And he himself. And that's, isn't that the most amazing thing? He's old, he says. But in verse 10, even I in my old age did come up to battle against the Lamanites. And again, at the end of verse 10, that same kind of language, it came to pass that we did go up in the strength of the Lord to battle. These were people that were prepared to do the very best they could, and they knew that the Lord would be with them. Now, this is the most unexpected thing about Zenith. This is the most, to me, most remarkable thing about this man. He's getting ready to go to battle. Their lives are at risk. And he spends from verse 11 through 18, essentially, giving them every reason to be understanding to the people that are coming to kill them. That's remarkable. That's what I mean about the fact that he seems to just love the Lamanites so much so that instead of a battle cry to get them all riled up to destroy their enemies, he is telling them, look, it's really not their fault. There's been a misunderstanding that they've been taught to hate us, and it's not their fault. It's the traditions of their fathers that are causing all these problems. Now, we still have to fight them, but that's so loving. He just loves Lamanites. I think that's one of the great things about this particular chapter is that we get a window into the politics. We get a good five verses, five, six verses on why the Lamanites hate the Nephites. 
Verse 12. They were a wild and ferocious and a bloodthirsty people, believing in the tradition of their fathers, which is this, believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers. Okay, so in other words, they were pulled out of Jerusalem. Laman and Lemuel were pulled out of Jerusalem because of his father, Lehi's wickedness. Okay, and that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren. So this would be Nephi and Sam and eventually Jacob and Joseph as well, I imagine. And they were also wronged while crossing the sea. Now, for the record that we have of their crossing the sea, I don't get that one. But I don't get a lot of these, I should say. Verse 13, And again, that they were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance, after they had crossed the sea. And all this because that Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore he was favored of the Lord, for the Lord heard his prayers and answered them, and he took the lead of their journey in the wilderness. Okay, so this is what made them mad, right? And his brethren were wroth with him because they understood not the dealings of the Lord. They were also wroth with him upon the waters because they hardened their hearts against the Lord. And again, they were wroth with him when they had arrived in the promised land because they said that they had taken the ruling of their people out of their hands and they sought to kill him. And again, they were wroth with him because they departed into the wilderness as the Lord commanded him and took the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass. For they said that he robbed them. So for the fact that they kept the plates of brass, they considered that thievery. Hmm. And thus they have taught their children that they should hate them and that they should murder them and that they should rob and plunder them and do all they could to destroy them. Therefore, they have an eternal hatred toward the children of Nephi. This is interesting. This whole dialogue is very interesting. Laman and Lemuel are victims. Everything happens to them. And they were cheated out of this, and they were cheated out of that, and they were robbed, etc. And this was passed down from generation to generation. Now, five centuries. This is a very long time to harbor this kind of hatred. And I'm sure that many of their children didn't fully understand why the Nephites were bad. They just knew that they were bad. Yeah. Now, from the Institute Manual, we get a great quote from Elder Richard G. Scott. This is from uh, April 1998 General Conference. He says, quote, Your Heavenly Father assigned you to be born into a specific lineage from which you received your inheritance of race, culture, and traditions. That lineage can provide a rich heritage and great reasons to rejoice. Yet you have the responsibility to determine if there is any part of that heritage that must be discarded because it works against the Lord's plan of happiness. You may ask how one can determine when a tradition is in conflict with the teachings of the Lord and should be abandoned. That is not easily done. I have found how difficult it is as I work to overcome some of my own incorrect traditions. Customs and traditions become an inherent part of us. They are not easy to evaluate objectively. Carefully study the scriptures and counsel of the prophets to understand how the Lord wants you to live. Then evaluate each part of your life and make any adjustments needed. Seek help from another you respect who has been able to set aside some deeply held convictions or traditions that are not in harmony with the Lord's plan. Is yours a culture where the husband exerts a domineering authoritarian role, making all the important decisions for the family? That pattern needs to be tempered so that both husband and wife act as equal partners, making decisions in unity for themselves and their family. These are other traditions that should be set aside. Any aspect of heritage that would violate the word of wisdom, that is based on forcing others to comply by the power of station, often determined by heredity, that encourages the establishment of caste systems, that breeds conflict with other cultures, end quote. We That's had talked excellent. about in an earlier episode the concept that if you have an ideology that forces you to hate somebody, 
and especially encourages you to kill somebody by virtue of what they said. You need a new ideology. Yeah, the one that we can relate to the most, though, is I think in the world of social media where people uh, are taught to hate other people Mm -hmm. by the way that they're shamed if they say this or that. And there's a lot more things that are closer to home, I think. There's lots of things in our day-to-day life that we can use this for as well. So, you know, watch for that. Is what you are embracing in your culture, your ethnicity or whatever, is it causing you to hate somebody? Even if you think there's a good reason, they thought they had a good reason, but that doesn't bring you closer to the Lord. So, yeah, it's what gave Zenith power, I think. These people are still our brothers and sisters. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think Zenith understood that. He had to go to war because they were attacking him. But I think he really dreamed of this place where they could all live together in peace. And uh, it's too bad that it didn't work out that way. They do win the battle. And at the end of his record, in verse 22. Verse 22. Such an interesting way to sign off. And now I, being old, did confer the kingdom to one of my sons. Uh, Let's go with Noah. You're sitting closest to me. Go ahead. Well, it's kind of like he's not enthusiastic with any of the choices. (laughs) Now, I I only say that because in other records it says that I give it to my son so-and-so. But we never hear him say that. I did confer the kingdom upon one of my sons. Therefore, I say no more, except he does. And may the Lord bless my people. Amen. What a wonderful way to the point to sign off. We do find out in the next chapter who that son happens to be. I'll bet you know. You can peek in verse 1 if you want, but we'll talk about that next week. We were to later learn that he had 16 sons and Noah was the best one. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that would be so sad. Great king, horrible father. I don't Mm. know. I'm sure he was a great father. So... That's it for this week's assignment. We appreciate you listening to the show. We're so grateful for your comments, and we really hope that you're staying inside the scriptures and reading along with us. We're having a great time, and we look forward to talking to you next episode. And may the Lord bless you. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. 